I think I'm going to begin. Good evening. Welcome to St. Hilda's. And welcome to the third and final workshop in this academic year under the title Brain and Mind from Concrete to Abstract. Tonight's topic is addiction in the brain. And I hope you all have a program that we've left for you on the chair. The program gives you the speaker, a bit of a biography, a bit of an abstract about what they're going to be speaking tonight, and a couple of articles that they recommend or, or books that you might want to read for your edification after this. Many of you will have come to one of these workshops before, as this is the second year we've been running them here at St. Hilda's. Given that this is an exam term for our students, I'd particularly like to welcome those who've given our precious revision time to attend. And of course, this is true also of A-level students. We often have a, a large contingent of A-level students, but it's also an exam term for them. But any A-level students that manage to get here today, I welcome you particularly and thank you for coming. This year we've planned our program in collaboration with the Center for Values-Based Practice in Health and Social Care, which is based at St. Anne's College here in Oxford. I think they're playing around with the uh, microphone to get it right. And our aim has been to explore different aspects of mental health. I'm very pleased to be able to thank, one last time, the LACES Trust, an educational charity with particular interests in philosophy of psychiatry, for their generous funding support this year. We will run three more workshops next year, and I can tell you now what we're proposing to do, subject to change, and when we're proposing to do it, again, subject to change. Please look at our website, which is now up and running. Just click on St. Hilda's, click on research, and then click on research events, and you can see what we'll be doing. By the beginning of the summer, we should have that up. Now, just if you want to put something in your diary, we're pretty sure it's going to be Thursday, the 19th of October, for the Michaelmas term event. And these are the topics we're considering doing. We're thinking of doing a session on perception, quite generally, then looking at memory, and then looking at perception and time. So that would be a nice unit if that's what we managed to put together. It should be clear by now that our aim in these workshops is to promote an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach to complex issues. I said that this year we were concerned largely with issues to do with mental health. In Michaelmas term, we discussed depression in the brain. The discussion of depression has some connection with tonight's topic of addiction. I say this because both topics can be thought to raise interesting questions about the relationship between mental health and physical health. I want to say just a few words by way of introduction to tonight's talk. I just want to set the stage before the experts speak. It's often a good place to start when one is puzzled by a term to head to the dictionary. So that's what I did. And I discovered, very interestingly, that the Oxford English Dictionary gives the following definition of the word addiction. First, a formal giving over or delivery by sentence of court, hence a surrender or dedication to a master. And second, the state of being self-addicted, to be given to a habit or pursuit or devotion. I was interested in this legal part of the definition, and I learned that in Roman law, an, addic an addictus was a person given over as a bond slave to a creditor. I also learned that the word traditionally has both a negative and a positive connotation. It's been used in a positive sense to suggest devotion. Both the negative and positive senses are reflected in that dictionary definition. It's worth comparing this dictionary and historical definition to the term with the modern definition given by certain bodies, and I chose two at random. One is the National Institute on Drug Abuse, and I'm going to give you the first sentence of their definition. Addiction is defined as a chronic, relaxing brain disease that is characterized by compulsive drug-seeking and use despite harmful consequences. One more. There are many of this sort. The American Society of Addiction Medicine begins its rather lengthy definition in a similar vein. They say addiction is a primary chronic disease of brain, reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. How 
Callum characterizes the condition of addiction, I think, is one of the issues associated with the study of it. It's interesting to notice how talk of habituation and pursuit has given over to talk of brain disease. And it would seem that this more modern talk also leaves behind entirely any idea of the positive in the idea of addiction. It's my understanding that before the 19th century, the term is not necessarily associated with drug use, and that this more restrictive use of the term emerges in our language along with the rise of temperance and anti-opium movements in the 19th century. The term has become associated with intemperance, with excessive alcohol and opium use and other drug use, it's, and other uses of other substances. It has been argued that this association of addiction with drug and alcohol use was not a medical or scientific discovery, but was part of a transformation of social thought. It has been labeled by one writer on this topic as the moral model of addiction. Indeed, it's been argued that the medicalization of addiction, the consideration of it as a disease of the body, can be seen at least in part as a move to rid the term of its social stigma. The disease model can be viewed as a much needed corrective to the moral model. These are people who are bad, in some way evil, out of control. But the disease model may be thought too to leave the agent out of the picture. We begin to believe that the addict has no choice some have argued that we need to see the addict as indeed having a choice, as being a responsible agent, but we also need to disassociate that from the idea of punishment and demonization. As one writer has suggested, we must not deny the addict his or her agency, but support and empower her or him to make different choices. Our attitude needs to be one of respect and compassion instead of stigma and hostility. In any case, I hope I've set the stage in such a way that you can see what a deep and complex issue this is. And now I'm going to hand it over to the experts to tell us more about it. Our first speaker tonight is Professor Jeff Daly from Cambridge University, where he's Professor of Behavioral Neuroscience. Um, thank you very much. It's a great <coughs> pleasure to be here this evening. Um, I'm particularly grateful to the Latest Trust for sponsoring this event. I'm sure it will stimulate um, a great deal of discussion. Um, to mention I'm a behavioural neuroscientist in Cambridge, I'm really interested in the brain mechanisms of addiction. And the question that might seem quite straightforward to ask is why do people become addicted to drugs? Um, it turns out this is quite a difficult question to address. Um, and the specific question that we, we ask is why do some people become addicted to drugs? It's very clear that a number of people initiate and experience various drugs, including alcohol. But a small subgroup, very between 10 and 20 percent, um, eventually <coughs> show harmful drug use. And the work we're doing in Cambridge is, is attempting to understand what are the underlying vulnerabilities which determine this particular um, predisposition in this group? Now, um, there are many drugs. I've mentioned alcohol. Alcohol is a uh, socially accepted um, drug. Um, you should think of it as a drug. It's an incentive. Uh, it has strong rewarding properties. It also has strong reinforcing properties. In other words, behavior uh, continues um, and Persistent and it's driven essentially by gaining access to, for example, in this case, alcohol. And there are strong conditioning elements. You might imagine a rather convivial environment drinking alcohol that, you know, this is a, a pleasurable event. And indeed, uh, it is. But in cases where alcohol consumption um, comes out of control, um, you can then think of the rather um, negative aspects. And David Nutt, um, in fact, who I did my first postdoc with a number of years ago, um, came up with this um, way of classifying the harmful use of various drugs, including alcohol. And you can see on the far left hand column that it's alcohol which is causing the greatest harm both to the individuals 
and the wider community. Um, you look at various class A drugs, heroin, crack cocaine, injectable amphetamines, they produce harm to the individuals, but their collective score is lower than alcohol. So why do people take drugs? If we think of alcohol, we could think of it in terms of a coping reaction, a way of alleviating stress uh, or anxiety. Um, this diagram, which is um, formulated by Cube and Lamol, an opponent process, essentially um, taking drugs initially is um, one could consider as an impulse control um, process where there may be some uh, tension or increased arousal prior to taking drugs, um, the act of taking drugs, and then the pleasure and the relief of this period of gratification. And following that, um, there's some period of regret, or guilt, or self-reproach over that behavior. But in the blue there, you can see that the motivational process that's driving this is positive. In a sense, what you're taking drugs for is the hedonic or pleasurable experience of, of that experience. Um, drug addiction is a brain disorder. It's a progressive brain disorder. Um, for chronic drug intake, you can see that if you come into the compulsive cycle of this disorder, that the motivational processes underlying drug taking become different. There's a delayed negative reinforcement process, which becomes um, very evident. The positive reinforcement mechanisms begin to decay. And it's thought at this stage that you're drinking or taking drugs to alleviate anxiety or stress. And in a sense, it's um, avoiding some of the negative um, consequences of drug taking. But what I find extraordinary is that people who engage in harmful drug use are surely aware of the harms which that behaviour is causing. So one might consider smoking, the message on um, advertising and cigarette packets is very explicit of the harms that's caused, uh, respiratory disorders, cancer. Um, you'll see in the middle images here these uh, magnetic resonance imaging scans of the human brain. On the far left you have two images of the control subject. And on the right, it's not entirely clear, but this is a, um, an age-matched individual um, with adolescent onset drinking. And there's white matter on the very margins of the brain. You can see grey matter, and you can see that there is an atrophy of grey matter. And there is a almost an opening up of the outer margin of the cerebral cortex. And in the centre of the brain, those dark cavities, <coughs> the ventricles begin to enlarge. So the very obvious structural <coughs> changes which occur, and it's, it's very um, uh, debilitating neurological consequences of excessive drinking. And if only people be educated that it's abstinence, a period of a few days during the week, where some of the th effects you see could be reversed. I think it would be a very important educational message. But it is interesting that harmful drug intake happens with the knowledge that these drugs are causing harm. Okay, I'm going to take you back now. If you think about the neuroscience of addiction and where it all started. Well, actually, it's, it started with this pioneering study by Old and Milner, 1954. It's a grainy image, black and white and all of that. But the data, the findings from the study were so important in our understanding of where in the brain um, reinforcing agents <coughs> drugs of abuse act. Now, here we have an animal trained to press a lever. There is an um, electrode placed into the brain. And every press of the lever delivers an electric shock, a small electric current into that local brain region. And what Old and Milner did was that they moved the electrode around until, and they found spots, hot spots, which reinforced this lever press um, behavior. And there were some areas of the brain that didn't support this behavior, and others that did. And it turned out that that um, stimulating electrode was placed in this pathway shown in the red which are the dopamine neurons. Um, this is a side section of the road of the brain, by the way. That structure called the VTA, the ventral tegmental area. It's where the cell bodies, the dopamine neurons, are located. Their projections 
um, to the structure of the nucleus accumbens uh, in the forebrain um, has subsequently became um, a very important area for addiction research. It was felt that um, addiction um, started and everything about addiction was centered on uh, dopamine dysfunction of this region. And in a sense, science became fixated on dopamine mechanisms in the nucleus accumbens. And if we look at a side view of the human brain, we can see the dopamine systems, um, it's homologous, I mean, they, they sit in the same region, the ventral tegmental area in the back of the brain, project into a number of regions, including the striatum and the frontal lobes. And it was discovered in the mid -night, late 1990s that all drugs of abuse acutely increase dopamine release, <coughs> increase dopamine release in the human brain. And that was a very important finding implicating this um, monoamine neurotransmitter system in aspects of addiction. And I won't talk too much about there's been a lot of or a number of theories about what dopamine is doing in addiction. Um, this is one theory, it's about incentive salience. Um, this is the subjective distinction between wanting, um, and this is the anticipation and preoccupation with drugs, what happens before drug taking and the liking responses, which is the hedonic outcome or evaluation of how pleasurable the drug is. And what's interesting, this is work by Robinson and Barrett, a very influential theory, was that the liking responses begin to diminish with chronic drug intake, but the wanting responses begin to sensitize. And that sensitization process was felt to be driven by increased dopamine transmission in this important pathway into the nucleus accumbens. I know um, this will be discussed more by Richard, perhaps, um, in his talk. And we can think of craving and these wanting, subjective wanting responses. We use functional magnetic resonance imaging. Um, this coloured area is an activation. This is a hemodynamic response, which is aligned onto a structural grey um, image of the human brain. And you can see during craving, there's an area in the frontal lobes which shows a strong activation during the periods of, of craving. But of course, the field of science always moves on. Um, people working in addiction now realize that there is a network of structures in the brain which are important both in the initiation, the maintenance, and the subsequent development of compulsive drug seeking and taking. Now, I don't, I'm not going to ask you to come through this diagram in great detail, only to point out that, for example, the BLA, the basolateral amygdala, has a very important role in conditioning. We know that conditioning is particularly important in addiction. Um, the hippocampus, a structure which is important in coding space and the environment. Um, and the frontal lobes, the prefrontal cortex, and how we mediate control or self-regulation over our behavior. So beyond dopamine, there are a number of networks and neurotransmitter systems which we know are important in drug addiction. But my work in Cambridge, and what my group uh, is particularly interested in, is this fact that addiction is non-random. It doesn't strike everyone uniformly. There are individuals which are predisposed, um, sometimes for genetic or biological reasons, or maybe it's through uh, gene by environmental interactions. And we can see some of the variables which we know are important, socioeconomic circumstances, quality, age, we'll talk more about age um, in a minute, um, IQ, mood disorder, uh, depression, anxiety, um, brain disorders, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, we know now is an antecedent, it tends to precede um, addiction. Uh, we know that there is a strong genetic component to addiction, approximately 50% uh, is heritable of this disorder. And my own special interest is in impulsivity. And when I talk about Kuhn and the model, that model, we know that there is a transition from behaviour which is impulsive, which is risky, preemptive, to behaviour which subsequently becomes compulsive in character. And we know we have found now that there is, we think of it, impulsive as a catalyst, an accelerant into 
future problematic drug use. And I'll just talk briefly about age and the importance of the age of onset of drug, drug intaking. We know that adolescence in particular is a period of great risk taking where individuals are often experiment with various compounds. Pavel and I will talk about legal highs. And the risk that you take when you take a capsule with unknown content there. Look at cannabis, a um, number of teenagers which engage in cannabis use, possibly a gateway drug into um, class B, class A drugs. Um, on the right hand side, this is the probability of developing cocaine dependence um, according to your age. And you see, the younger you are, the younger you start, the higher the probability of developing dependence. I think this is particularly important data to think of, and particularly in light of the way in which the brain develops from um, a young age, in this study, from five years of age through to 20 years of age. And what we're looking at here is the outer gray matter in the cerebral cortex. And you can see how it's sculpted and changes through this critical developmental period. And the importance of this work is that how drug use during this period interacts with this maturation or developmental process. Okay, so what do we need? What are the key ingredients for addiction? Well, there are three key ingredients. One is, of course, the agent or the drug, of course, and you need to gain somehow access to this drug. The other is a host, but not just any host, the host which is vulnerable or predisposed in some way. And the other important component of addiction is an environment which links these two elements together. So if we think of any drug, any drug of abuse, those three components somehow must come together for this process to start. I've talked about briefly about alcoholism. We know that one of the strong drivers there is about um, it's a coping response, stress reduction, possibly driven by um, work, uh, the pressures of work and the lifestyle choices. Um, so it's a displacement behaviour which you might engage and it continues and continues and that's stress in your job continues. Um, disorders like conduct disorder um, is we know now strongly uh, co-associates with addiction. People certain traits, sensation seeking, thrill seekers, people who throw themselves off mountain tops or cliff tops, um, are also people who are predisposed to acquire or initiate um, drug taking. My own interest is in attention deficit hyperactivity disorder which is a prevalent um, disorder in children. And the paradox here is that this disorder is treated by psychostimulant drugs, including amphetamine, uh, methamphetamine, which have themselves a high abuse liability. So I think you can see the circularity in treating a brain disorder like ADHD with a stimulant drug, which itself has abuse liability properties. And I've mentioned that um, addiction has a strong genetic component, approximately 50% or so, but it's not a uniform involvement or contribution to addiction. We know there are genes which um, are involved in traits like impulsivity, and it's considered that those genes are important in the very early stages. And as the addiction progresses, you can see that those genes become less and less important. Um, we have genes for risk taking, which are very important early on. Um, stress, responsivity, is something which shows an incremental involvement of genetic contributions. Environmental factors, likely to, as conditioning to context and happens that those genes suddenly become more important. So you can see that disorder is progressive and there is an underlying genetic basis and there are different traits and disorders which underlie addiction. Okay, so I'll just talk very briefly now about some of the work we're doing in Cambridge. This chap here, um, affectionately known as Zippy. Zippy is a naturally impulsive rat. It's an outbred rat, so it shows a, strong, a lot of uh, genetic variability. Um, it was a chance to discover it, and I'll just talk more about how we determined that this animal was impulsive. But what we subsequently discovered was that Zippy, being impulsive, uh, we could make very strong predictions about how this animal would react to cocaine, 
and more subsequent work on how it reacts to alcohol, heroin, sucrose. And it turns out to be a very interesting experimental approach into understanding the brain mechanisms of addiction. Before I get to that point, because Ziffy was so precious to us, um, what we did, this was seven years of work, and we're almost now at the stage of, of publishing this work. Ziffy up here on the far left, uh, this is a pedigree, a multi-generational pedigree of rats which Ziffy has sired. So what we did, we, we crossed Ziffy with nine females, females in the circles, males are in the squares, if we phenotype you, we determine that your behaviour is impulsive, you will show up in the red colour, like Zippy, and if you're non-impulsive, it will show up in a blue colour. What we've done here is a classical inbreeding approach, looking to, to strengthen the incidence of this behavioural trait. You can see, if you look across different generations of breeding, the red colours begin to concentrate in the high impulsive line, and the blue colours with some exceptions, begin to concentrate in the low impulsive line. What we've done now, we've done a quantitative trait loci, we've looked on a chromosome now, looking at a linkage, and we've found a number of genes which show differential expression in these two lines of inbred rats. So, if you call something a trait, you need to demonstrate that it's heritable. We've demonstrated that. It's taken seven years to get to this point. So, why is Zippy so fascinating to us? Well, what Zippy has, Zippy has a problem in waiting for future rewards. And I'm sure in this cartoon here, I'm sure you couldn't wait for this tasty morsel of um, bisquack, um, whatever this is. And essentially, this is an end of phenotype. This is a, a behavior which sits beneath an obvious phenotype. But it's an end of phenotype which contributes in some way to the subsequent behaviours which, which we measure. And one of Zippy's problems here is that you can't tolerate delays for future reinforcement. Like they're aversive. And so what Zippy prefers is instant gratification. And instant gratification is one of the strong end of phenotypes or measures in drug addiction, cocaine addiction, heroin addiction, alcoholism that your delayed discounting, your ability to tolerate delayed rewards becomes impaired. And this is of interest in attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. This is one of the end of phenotypes, one of delay aversion, which has been strongly implicated in this neurodevelopment disorder. So there's some very interesting links between this outward rat and this delay aversion, ADHD and impulsivity. Okay, so how do we measure uh, impulsive behaviour in this animal here? Um, this was published in Science a number of years ago. Now it's an old, old study. This box on the right, uh, there's Zippy there, looking down on Zippy. This is a, a chamber with five apertures, and there are uh, lights at the back of each of these apertures, which are presented for a brief period of time. And the job of Zippy here is simply to detect which spatial location that light has been presented. The light's on for half a second. It's quite tough actually for an animal to detect spatially where this is occurring. And if he gets it correct, which they do on 80% or so of trials, a food pellet is delivered in the front magazine. Now it takes about four months to phenotype an animal's task. So you can see that multi-generational pedigree. How much work has gone into phenotyping over 600 animals on this particular task? Okay, so the trial which we're very interested in is a premature trial. It's a trial which anticipates when this cue is about to happen. And what I've mentioned here is a problem waiting, and he jumps the gun. So before the light stimulus is presented, he's made his response, the light comes next. And he's constantly given feedback that this is happening. Nevertheless, he continues to make this maladaptive premature response. And now, if I go to the data, which suggests this is very interesting, this is an um, intravenous self-administration chamber on the left. Um, we implant a catheter into the jugular vein, and in the syringe at the top is, um, has cocaine added into a saline solution. The rat is trained to press one or two levers. If it presses the active lever, a very small volume of cocaine is delivered. Now, 
Zippy or animals in this paradigm have complete control over how much drug they have. It's completely volitional on their behavior. And if you look at the graph on the right, in the blue, the low impulsive animals, um, they will self-administer cocaine at a relatively steady or regulated rate. But animals, the high impulsive animals like Zippy, begin to show escalation. And so their response begins to increase, 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 increase. What's more, if you punish that behavior and give a negative um, response um, for taking cocaine, Zippy's behavior continues. So one of the defining definitions of addiction is behavior which continues or is channeled despite adverse consequences. So what eventually Zippy develops is this compulsive drug taking tendency. And this behavior um, extends into alcohol and extends into sucrose as well. So there's commonalities in those, those two drugs of abuse. So what else do we know about Zippy? Cambridge, um, we have a brain imaging uh, facility which uses a number of techniques to visualize the brain. Uh, this technique is called positron emission tomography where we inject a radioactive substance. Um, the radioactive substance uh, binds to a receptor in the brain. In this case, it's to a dopamine receptor. Uh, if you look at those scans in the center, you can imagine a person lying in the scan of their feet coming towards you. We're looking at the uptake of this radioactive tracer as it binds to the receptor in the brain. And the way the technique works is that when the radioactive substance binds, it releases a particle, it collides with an electron essentially, and it releases radiation. And we can determine where that radiation has occurred, <coughs> coincidence, and we can reconstruct this image, which occurs beautifully um, as, as seen there. And in addiction, one of the robust markers that we see in particular cocaine addiction, um, alcohol addiction, heroin addiction, is a reduction in dopamine D2 receptors. And in the top there, we have a control on the left. And this is looking in the region of the stratum. On the control, you can see um, avid uptake of the tracer. And the cocaine abuser, now abstinent, you can see his reduction in this um, tracer. And it's one of the most replicated findings in addiction that Drug addiction is associated with reduction in this marker. If you look in the frontal lobes, there's reduced activity. The problem of this research in humans, it's impossible, it's the Gordian knot, of knowing where these changes in the brain were caused by chronic drug taking, or it was a vulnerability marker. And it's virtually impossible to disentangle in human drug addicts. You get it some way for the the duration of drug taking and what extent of down regulation D2 receptors, but it's not a perfect way of doing it. What we can do in animals is use exactly the same imaging technique, positron emission tomography. This tracer, it's called Thalipride. Um, you can see the colored images there. This is a, um, a horizontal section of the rat brain. Um, you can see here the nucleus accumbens, which has this rich input from dopamine neurons. You can see there in the low impulsive animals, um, higher uptake of this tracer than in the high impulsive animal. And the most important aspect of this is that this difference between the high and the low impulsive animal has occurred prior to cocaine exposure, suggesting that this is a marker which is already evident. evident and predisposes these animals to subsequent escalation of compulsive drug taking. Okay, I don't want to take any more time, I know it's much more interesting to discuss various ideas, but um, on the back of all that work, of course, the media tend to interpret in certain ways. And they suggested that, from this, that some babies are predetermined to take drugs, that drug addicts are born and not made, say scientists. Of course, this is not what this work is about. What we're suggesting are that there are markers, biomarkers, endophenotypes, which singularly or collectively um, act as catalysts. It's not a guarantee under any circumstances that an individual would show 
the compulsive drug tendencies. But I think it's important more for understanding the various roots into addiction. And if you can get in early, before damage is done to the brain, there is a chance to educate and form and other forms of rehabilitation and treatment before it's too late. So there, I'll leave it. And thank you for your attention. Um, the work we do in Cambridge is funded by the uh, Medical Research Council, the Wellcome Trust, um, the Borough of Ingleheim, and there are a number of people um, who have contributed to the studies which we work on. So thank you very much. Dr. Paolo De Luca, who is a senior lecturer in addictive behavior with a background in cognitive and developmental psychology at the Institute of Psychiatry in London. Okay, just a second that I swap with my Mac. I'm kind of addicted to the Macintosh. So. I uh, really operate on the PC more uh, in a second too. That's so. fine. Well, while you're doing that, let me just say that um, we're not exactly on time, so don't worry about that. I'll, I'll sort of modulate and regulate. So after this, we will have time for a bit of discussion of the two, the two talks. Then we'll have a cup of tea. Then we'll come back and do a little, hear a little philosophy. And then we'll have a bigger discussion. Okay? So that's the trajectory for the rest of the afternoon. Obviously, my addiction to the Macintosh is not good. <laughs> Let me see if I can sort it out. If anybody has a burning question, will the techies sort this out? Um, we could actually just ask um, Professor Daly any questions if you want to ask anything at the moment. If there's anything that has what came up as a result of what he was talking about. I, I actually, I, I, I assume, I suppose, I guess I always want to know what these things are. I was wondering about this disability marker, which you were a bit cautious about. I was just wondering, could you just say a little bit about what a disability marker is? Okay, this <clears throat> particular marker is interesting because if we think of addiction in terms of disregarding negative consequences, there are, there are two pathways modulated, one modulated by this marker, and that's about these negative aspects. The other channel is modulated by a different dopamine receptor. Those two respond differently to, to drugs. And we think that the way in which it might happen is that there is um, the D2 receptor becomes more and more downregulated, and, and consequently, behavior is channeled towards the first channel, which is the second dopamine receptor. So is it, is, it, is it a disability marker, or are there several disability markers? There, there are likely many yeah. markers. Yeah. Um, this, we've worked a lot of work on this animal, but it, it turns out there are, there are um, other cortical abnormalities which distinguish the high impulsive from the low impulsive as well. Mm -hmm. And by disability, do you mean disability vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the brain? Or do you mean disability vis-a-vis -vis kind of I, I personal? I, yeah, I must say, I don't see it as a disability ah. market, actually. I thought I think you used the word. I, that's mm, what, did I say you yeah, no. forgot the wrong word? <laughs> no. Uh, it, it's simply a biomarker. A biomarker. Bio okay. so something which associates and is robust as a, as a way of almost diagnosing this trait. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't consider it as, as a disability in that right. sense. Did I pick up the word Maybe. Wrong? Okay. Sorry about that. My, my mistake. <coughs> yeah. um, Thank you. I was wondering about, so I've heard Dopamine talks a lot about sort of learning, goal based learning and all that kind of learning. And then there's this thing to sort of complete the other side of it that's to do with wanting and desiring to do something. How are those two um, linked together, the kind of goal based learning versus like learning and wanting to do something? <coughs> 
So d dopamine, as I intimated, um, works in several levels of that forebrain structure. So I talked about the nucleus accumbens, and as a drug taking continues, there is an involvement of different areas of that striatum. One involved in habits, and that is a dopamine modulated process. And habits we think of as probably maladaptive and something we don't particularly want to develop, but it's completely adaptive for the brain to develop think of habits. Habits is a, a way of um, automatizing behavior so that cognition is taken offline. It's a way of behavior becoming um, more readily accessed and executed. Um, in terms of learning, we know that dopamine plays a major role in learning and the way um, memories are formed and how they're stabilised. And there is a very prominent theory about maladaptive learning and that there are shifts from goal-directed behaviour, which you have control over, to habits, um, and there are progressive transitions. Um, okay, we'll come, perhaps come back to it in the discussion after the next talk. Thank you. I guess you're... Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak about uh, the work that I'm doing at the uh, Queen's College in London. Um, can we have a show of hands about whether you know about legal highs or you heard about legal highs? Okay, so fairly known at least. We, um, so this is a, a line of work that I um, started uh, around 15 years ago. I was successful in getting some funding from the European Commission and to do a, a wide European study on, on the information uh, available on drugs that uh, were available on, over the internet at the time, 2001-2002, the internet was at the early stages of, of as a kind of platform for drug information among all the other things that you can get over there. So we, we got this funding for the Psychonaut 2002 study. And the main aim of the study at the time was to look at what kind of information you were likely to get if you were searching for any illicit uh, uh, substance, so like cocaine, ecstasy, and, and cannabis. And what we found at the time was that uh, if you were searching for those uh, substances, you were more likely to get information that was promoting the use of these substances compared to all other sources uh, that were discouraging their use. But crucially, what we also identified with that study, that was the first uh, study done in a, at a European level in looking at different languages, so it was a very kind of wide um, effort to understand the, the, what was out there over the internet was that uh, we identified webs, well, we identified two things. First, that uh, people were not only just talking about uh, cannabis and uh, cocaine or ecstasy or heroin, but they were also talking about uh, novel substances that we actually didn't know what they were. So we had to go and find uh, info uh, more information about those substances. And not just that, there were also places where you could actually directly buy these things online and, and that was kind of remarkable because uh, it was fairly new to, to, to us as a, uh, something that you could do uh, uh, in, in, in the early 2000s. And then obviously that uh, evolved in, uh, in further grants from the European Commission up to the latest study on the Cassandra study where we are trying to uh, implement some uh, machine learning uh, uh, technologies to monitor more easily uh, all the information that you can get from uh, Twitter, from other uh, forums on, on, this, uh, on these substances. Um, <clears throat> as, a, as a kind of a starting point, I mean, they, they, we should probably talk about the definition of these substances. They, they, are, told, they are called legal highs on, on media and we tend to call them novel psychoactive substances. In reality, they are not really novel or new. They, they, are, they are novel in the way they are used, and they are used in a recreational way, and they are marketed online as a legal alternative to uh, common illicit drugs. 
Um, and a few famous examples are methadone and spice uh, uh, that were legal when they emerged on the, on the, in, into the market uh, a few years back. Um, as a phenomenon, it's not really new, the fact that you get the new substances on the market. Uh, we had, uh, you know, just to name a few, we had LSD developed and introduced into the market. Uh, we had cocaine, we had uh, uh, ecstasy uh, in the past. So it's not really new, this, this aspect of uh, drug addiction and drug uh, promotion that is evolving um, through, uh, through, throughout the time. Um, but also, obviously, there are some uh, there are clear differences in, in, in the way that is uh, currently happening. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of uh, 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 Alexander Shulgin. He was um, uh, or Alex Shulgin he was a, fam a fairly famous uh, um, pharmacologist, and uh, he wrote a. a a couple of uh, very important uh, books. One is uh, called Pickle, uh, a chemical love story, which is uh, essentially his discovery of a group of uh, compounds. Uh, together with his uh, partner, they synthesized more than, that. across these two books, more than 260 uh, compounds. And they also describe in details how you could actually uh, come up with these substances and they describe the, the kind of um, effects that you could have by by, the, by uh, consuming these substances. But back in in the 75, is also was already forecasting uh, what we are having now in terms of uh, drug development, where the number of substances coming onto the market is such that it's kind of a, an, an, is an unimaginable uh, uh, situation. In fact, if you look at the statistics there, I don't have a pointer, but you probably see my pointer there. Um, in the last few years, we had, uh, on average, two new compounds entering into the market. Uh, so we had the 98 in 2015. This is the latest data available. Uh, uh, last year, uh, data will be available, uh, uh, I guess, at the end of this uh, May of May and 101 in 2014. So you can see a steady increase, especially if you look at the uh, previous years where back in uh, 2011 we only had 50 or half of those and 2010 is not there, but we, we, were, we had just 24 substances entering into the market at the time. So in total so far we have more uh, 560. Obviously this is up to last year. Uh, tally, uh, it will be more now, and the vast majority of these new substances have entered the market in the last five years. And <coughs> because they are uh, obviously marketed to uh, as legal alternatives to uh, illicit compounds, they tend to be targeting uh, the cannabis, so most of them are synthetic cannabinoids, and others are synthetic catenones that are targeting more the uh, um, uh, ecstasy uh, kind of compounds. And it's also uh, an international phenomenon. It's not just restricted to the, to the UK. Um, when we were doing the cyclone study, we were actually identifying some trends in movement. So we were spotting some substances first in, in Finland, and then moving towards Denmark and, and the UK, and, and later on in, in, in Italy and, and Spain. So not all the substances are appearing at once into, the, in, into all the national markets, but there is an evolution of how these are uh, um, coming onto the market, especially in, in this case. We, we have seen a lot of new substances appearing first in Europe, and then later on in the US. For once, at least, with Europe was leading on, the, on this new market uh, uh, in comparison to the, to, the, to the US. In terms of um, how they are marketed, they are marketed as uh, um, uh, not for human consumption, obviously, uh, or like plant feeder or plant, uh, plant cleaner, or, um, and that just to avoid any kind of regulation for um, 
that might uh, otherwise uh, limit the, the um, availability online. Back in 2011, the UK government introduced this uh, temporary cl uh, class drug order and it was an attempt to limit the availability of new substances coming onto the market. And they, that was a response to the problem that we had with methadone that uh, when it appeared in, in 2009 and it took uh, more than 18 to two years, 18 months to two years uh, for the UK government to implement uh, a legislation to limit uh, the, the availability of this drug or to put it as a, an, under a class uh, A drug. So that was a, that's a, um, a very quick uh, instrument that allowed the authorities to um, ban the, the, the sale of these substances on the <coughs> assumption it, you don't, they don't really need to have the proofs of being uh, 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 harmful or being misused but just the, the likelihood of being misused or having harmful effects to people. And as you probably know last year, uh, just actually almost a year ago, the UK government also introdu introdu uh, introduced the Psychoactive Substance Act, which is a blanket ban on all psychoactive substances, which is such a blank instrument that had to obviously have a, a long list of substances that were excluded, like uh, alcohol, nicotine, and caffeine, because the definition of uh, psychoactive is anything that is, uh, is, is stimulates the central nervous system, so it's a fairly uh, kind of um, comprehensive uh, definition that will catch almost everything, even as some food uh, will be included there if not exempted by the, by the Act. So these are kind of the two main instruments that uh, the UK has introduced. Um, not all the other European countries have done a similar um, uh, gone through a similar uh, path. Uh, Poland introduced a similar act uh, in 2010, Ireland did it uh, earlier on as well, but mostly the other countries are trying to target individual substances uh, when they emerge rather than having this uh, blank uh, approach. Um, so in, in terms of uh, how, so how, how big is this, is this problem? So we, we have uh, a hundred new substances every year, but uh, so what? How many people then uh, decide to use them? So it, it's, it's obviously a difficult um, uh, uh, things to um, estimate, especially because of the shared number of new substances and the inability of certain surveys to capture uh, specific information. So for, for instance, the British Crime Service added the spice compounds in 2009, then added methadone in 2010, then laughing gas and salvedivinorum in the following year, and then they stopped. They decided to actually use a generic term for all these substances, otherwise the survey would you know, become too long and uh, to be completed by anyone. But you get there some, uh, some numbers um, uh, when methadone was uh, individually identified for those uh, 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 surveys. And we, at the beginning, when it was um, um, uh, popular, it was around 1.4% in, in the general population, meaning 16 to 59 years old. But then obviously if you look at the younger age groups, like the 16 to 25, 24 years old, obviously the prevalence goes up, uh, is a drug that is used mostly by young people. And for comparison, you can see that cannabis is uh, around 77% in the population, and cocaine is 2.2% uh, and ecstasy 1.4%. So the use of methadone at one point was as high as ecstasy. And in, in reality, methadone was marketed as an alternative to ecstasy, so it's, it's, it's plausible that people were moving from one drug to the next one. But in general, all the other NPS, you can see here the prevalence is fairly, fairly low. 
Uh, then, and this is from general population surveys, then you have uh, more specific surveys that are conducted with specific uh, population like this uh, mixed market or uh, global drug survey and then you can see that uh, the prevalence of use of these substances is much higher. In this case again it's focusing on uh, methadone, so you, so you have 41% of the people interviewed that used uh, methadone in 2009 up uh, 51% in the following year. When the banning was introduced, then the following year it dropped to 20%. So you can see that uh, the introduction of a ban uh, had an impact on, on consumption. We also have other indicators to understand a bit more how these uh, substances are in terms of their harmfulness or uh, liability to, uh, uh, to uh, traditions. Uh, and for instance, they, we have a national uh, database for the people attending uh, treatment services, this NDTMS. And again, it, there are some difficulties in understanding the data because it's not always clear, um, it's not always recorded uh, in, in a separate way um, what substance they presented to. Uh, but we have some data from methadone again. And it, 1,400 people attended uh, services for addiction uh, in 2013, and that almost doubled, actually more than doubled in, in 2015. But again, those are just 1% of the people in treatment, so we have 300,000 people in treatment in every given year in the UK, and 1% um, of those are, are for methadone at the moment and all the other NPS is uh, barely 1,200 in, in the same year. Again, we need to take these numbers uh, as they are, but you know, they, of the 300,000 people in treatment, half of them are for heroin, and then you have 30% of 68,000 uh, people that are in treatment for alcohol, but we also know that uh, 1.6 million people in the UK have, are, are addicted to alcohol. So it also means that not everyone is actually accessing treatment as they should. So this is, could be that um, people might be aff uh, affected by their NPS use, but they don't think or they don't know that they can actually access uh, treatment services for their problems. And the similar. Uh, issue is um, uh, could be said for the for the mortality data, where we have uh, an increasing number of people that are reported uh, uh, having died from NPS use. So from 31 in 2011 to 114 in 2015. Again, not all the, it's not very easy to uh, um, to identify NPS. In, 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 the, uh, in the body, so sometimes people are not tested for specific NPS, <coughs> so they might be not might not be recorded as, as a kind of a one of the compounds that are leading uh, to the to the death of somebody. But again, the, the numbers um, are fairly fairly small uh, uh, if you compare it with the any other drugs. Uh, for the same for the same year. Now, in terms of availability, <coughs> NPS are mostly uh, marketed uh, online, uh, um, and the way they, they are marketed, or you, you can easily find them by by searching on Google or other search engines. I'm not really encouraging uh, encouraging you to do this. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, just is to show you that uh, you know that there are plenty of uh, websites out there that they, they do promote and sell uh, substances. Um, one, one example is, uh, is this one. Uh, don't take down the, the web address because anyway this is uh, this is gone. It's not it's no longer there. But again, they, they, they are. This is again just to show you some. Of, this is a very simple uh, website. It's a it's a one pager. With 20, 25 uh, compounds, with very brief description of what you get. So sometimes it's just uh, the chemical structure. So you have to then Google the chemical structure to understand what uh, what, what you're getting. 
and um, sometimes they're just uh, it's like the pack of bonbon there was nothing else but you know they tend to be very uh, you know they can have some nice colorful uh, grounds as well as just uh, uh, sachet with uh, white powder so or just um, peels so not much to 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 know if you don't really know but there are other websites that are a bit more complex in structure. They look like uh, uh, um, um, you know, like John Lewis. You you got your next day <laughs> delivery. You get uh, your 100% secure discreet, so you don't get any. You know, it's a it's a brown envelope that you get. Nothing that will uh, will uh, arise any any suspicion. You get your price uh, much promise. You know, if you find it cheaper somewhere else, you probably get your <laughs> your money back if you're lucky. And then uh, there are also loyalty point schemes. So the more you buy, you probably the, the bigger the, the discounts later on. So it, it, it's, it's a fairly you know you have uh, those people making up it's very simple sub, uh, website and other that are uh, obviously putting a lot of uh, uh, effort into, into the online market. And obviously, if you are not really sure, you can always go for the top seller, so you, you can just uh, take what other people are taking. But then, uh, oops, that was too fast. So you also, we also have seen uh, the development of the market by introducing Bitcoin, so cryptocurrencies, if you, if you, if you are aware of those, so you, that will allow you to buy uh, <coughs> Things online for uh, anyone knowing that you are actually buying it, so you will, you will, you are avoiding using your credit card from uh, you know higher security for yourself. And then you also get this Black Friday offers, you get uh, the, the Christmas uh, sales. So it, it is a bit um, it's, it's, it's it's like an online uh, um, high street shop essentially. Um, but uh, to go back to the kind of us understanding the size of it, we, it is obviously the online market is growing. We, when we did the 2002 study, we only identified 90 websites. Yeah, and um, uh, later on, uh, we the number of websites went up to 690. So you can see a, a progression of. Uh, you know, of this platform uh, as a kind of uh, the main platform to sell, to sell or at least promote uh, MPS. But then again, from the global track survey that I mentioned earlier, or from the British Crime Survey, you can see that just one in ten of the people that have bought uh, drugs in the last year have done have, have bought them uh, online, and that number goes even down to one percent for from the British. Uh, crime surveys of the two different populations, but uh, just to give you an idea, now it's almost um, you know probably I have too many slides as always, but uh, just to give you a couple of more uh, um, data on, 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 on these things, we we have seen a change after the introduction of the ban. You can see here that uh, most websites were preparing for the ban last year in, on the 24th of May. That was the last day for buying things. So a lot of those websites that we were monitoring were closed down uh, following the ban and they moved on uh, onto the crypto markets. So they moved onto the Silk Road uh, 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 platforms. We have seen an increment of listings and number of compounds and uh, sellers on those websites. But it's also true that uh, the market is now coming back to the open market, to the online market. They essentially relocated outside the UK and they are selling from outside the UK into the UK markets. It is obviously difficult to, for the customer to identify a gram of anything in a brown envelope coming from anywhere outside the, the, this country. So it's, it's obviously <coughs> not you know, your chances of being uh, caught are very, are very minimal. And, um, and uh, just a couple more slides to finish. I mean, the, this is a, what we really know about uh, these substances is, uh, is, very, is very little, actually. 
and what we get usually is that we, as soon as we identify a new compound, we look at what other people are saying or the user, the early, the early users are saying online. So we go to the uh, forums, we try to understand what the, they are saying, what they are the effects, and um, and obviously that will after that we can build new questionnaire, we can get m more data from uh, from animal and clinical studies, but the sheer number of substances obviously will limit the ability that we have both to understand what, what's happening and also to provide uh, some reasonable um, um, advice to, to users. And, but they are mostly, you can, uh, all, you can uh, classify all these substances under these under these six categories, and 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 it, and I need to just then go to my final slides just to summarize it. That um, we we have seen throughout Europe uh, uh, the, the the consumption of illicit drugs like uh, cannabis and and. Uh, and cocaine is, or other stimulants, is remaining stable. Um, but obviously, I've, I've just shown you that in the last 10 years, we have, a, we have had a number of substances coming onto the market, which they they have, some of them, actually, just methadone and spice and a few others, have become, probably have, have established themselves as a new drugs of choice. But the vast majority of these uh, 600 compounds have actually disappeared. So they come into, into the market for a very, very brief moment, a few months. A few people will test those substances. They might not ex uh, experience the effects they wanted, and then the market disappears for, for, those, for those substances. So just a very handful of, or a very small number of substances make through the illicit market and this, um, take this stage instead of ecstasy, for instance, or other stimulants like, um, or like uh, cannabis, like uh, uh, spice. But we've seen uh, on the media and uh, the problem that spice have had on, in prison settings and in a homeless population. So it's, it is actually a, a, an emerging problem that needs to be tackled. Thank you very much for the attention. Take these microphones. Do you remember how to use them? Do you remember how to use them? There's something you have to do. Press on the bottom, that's it. And um, if you have a few questions, we can have a few questions before we go and get our tea. That's not the yep. right. You, you got it. So, Very, very good question. Um, we know there are strong overlaps um, between lots of behavioural addictions with chemical addictions. You, you mentioned exercise addiction. I think this is a um, really interesting area, actually. I mean, you can, you can exercise up to a point, and then um, there is a phenomenon now that if, you know, for certain people who excessively exercise, and for some reason, if they can't exercise on a given day, maybe it's too wet, too cold, um, there are strong aversive consequences for that individual. And it's almost taking on the qualities of a behaviour which is becoming more important to that individual than perhaps other behaviours. Um, but there's lots of examples you mentioned, you know, there's, there's, there's pathological gambling. Um, you know, so I think what, whatever we talk about here in predispositions, I think there are strong overlaps with lots of different other um, interesting <coughs> sorts as well. I could also just be loud. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 this might not be true, but 
Is, okay. Um, do people mature out of addictive behavior? This is a thing I think I've heard before. So there's a big spike around 18 to 20, and then it, and then it drops off. Um, so it's not true. And then also, how does that bear on this point about impulsivity? Is it just that, is the thought then that people are more impulsive when they're 18 to 20 and less, or, I mean, how does it get? Yeah, another great question. Um, there are developmental explanations. I talked briefly about adolescence. Adolescence is a time of storm, a time of change, a time of risk-taking behaviour. And by and large, adolescence finishes. Um, males about 25, females 21 or 22 years of age. That's kind of the peak of that risk-taking behaviour. And it's interesting listening to the last talk with Pablo about those individuals that, that take legal highs, I think, are very different from you know, other, older people, perhaps, that are less risk-prone to take those drugs. Um, in terms of behavioural patterns of, of when you do age, just, you're right, I mean, the, the numbers come down. Um, but there's a large proportion of people who um, you know, do go beyond limits for alcohol. Um, we clear that, and maybe we could talk about that. But um, I think there are very interesting age-related changes which occur in some of these, these critical periods of development around adolescence. Yeah. I, I, I also mentioned in my talk that um, 1.6 million people in the UK are classified as uh, uh, dependent from alcohol. And then what you, you, what you can see is that a lot, a lot of them will naturally recover from their, their alcoholism. So there's a, you know, it's not everyone will need or will go through treatment to recover from it. So there's also that component. Um, yeah, you said your interest was um, how ADHD can affect um, or influence addiction. I was just wondering if there was any like, differences you found in the patterns between the impulse, related, uh, impulse control related disorders versus like compulsive disorders. Because, for example, I can't really see someone um, anorexic, for example, getting out, like becoming an alcoholic, because it would interact with um, some of their other aims, yeah. um, aiming to lose weight. So, do you find different patterns in those types of disorders? We, we haven't looked across the various impulse control disorders, mm -hmm. but it's an interesting question from the perspective that the neural circuits in the brain, which control some of these behaviours are common, but to some extent there's a parallel circuits. I mean, they, they operate in rather similar ways, but they're mediated by slightly different parallel circuits. So it's no surprise that many of these impulse control disorders show comorbidity, that some co-occur. Um, anorexia addiction, I mean, but it's not, it's not always as straightforward as that, I think. Um, I don't know, anything to add? Um, I, just want, I didn't want to take it away from the topics you discussed, but given the current political debate about legalizing cannabis, I just wondered what your thoughts on that was to people who looked into the, to the way the brain functions in regards to that. Um, <clears throat> well, it's not usually a very short answer in the sense that. Uh, um, you know, we can take a few hours to discuss the, the, the pro and cons. We, we can, I, personally, I could say that you know the, the war on drugs that started under under Nixon and, and Reagan onwards <coughs> hasn't really affected much the use of uh, or reduced the use of of, the, of any illicit drug. So in a, in a way, it's a, it's a failed policy. On the other hand, um, the recent uh, psychoactive uh, uh, act that I mentioned in my talk has changed uh, the availability of some substances. Obviously, the market is now readjusting to that uh, policy and trying to find different ways of uh, selling the same products from from abroad, for instance. So, in, in a way, uh, you know, the, 
uh, 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 solving the problem through uh, in, in this way is, is probably not working. In, in the, but in, I'm not want uh, you know I don't want I'm not condoning the use of, of substances in any way. I mean all of the MPS that I mentioned, for instance, are unknown in terms of harms and risks. So you are a guinea pig if you take if you take any one of those substances. You really don't know if a microgram is enough to make you feel anything or even to experience the most serious uh, uh, effects. So, so, my, so in a way, it's, it's a risky uh, behavior that, that, that uh, drugs, um, in this case, and is, is, uh, could be, you know, could, could result into. In terms of, uh, obviously, the cannabis is, 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 is in, on the scale of things from David Nutt scale, cannabis is, is a way down the, the probably at this end of the, of the scale. So it's a less harmful compound and experiences from Colorado and other states and, uh, and other places in the states have shown that legalizing the, the, the cannabis hasn't really increased the, the harm. Or um, so in, in a way, I'm open-minded to, to this to this option in the UK as well. Did you want to say well, only my comment would be that but who in the audience, who in the audience would like to see cannabis legalized? Is it would be a show? Of, is there anyone that would? The majority would. Yeah. Is there any particular reason for that? Here? Anyone? Anyone brave? To, yeah. I used to live in the Netherlands where mm-hmm. it's decriminalised, but yeah. not actually legal. And because of it, it's it's not legal in Holland, but there's this really weird in between situation where you can buy it, it's quite safe for the user. But because it's not fully legalized, it's still the um, supply is still very much black market and it's still gangs and whatever. And it's yeah. a really weird mixture. But it just sort of seems like the semi legalization has made it fairly safe for the user, but fully legalizing it would make it safe for everyone by at least for the most part removing a lot of the gang activity. It just seems a sort of natural thing to do. Yes. Okay. I'm going to suggest um, that we. Take a short break, um, no more than 10 minutes. So go out and have a cup of tea. Um, I think we have mini scones or something, yeah. which <laughs> sounds nice to me. And then I'll just clap and grab everybody to come back in pretty quickly, okay? So let's take about five minutes. That's the You mean that's actually true? Yes, not in Well, I do.
look, I'm afraid we can't bring the TV. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, that's one of the rules because this is a, a place that we often have um, music and dance and the floor as well. Okay. Um, are people getting a hand up then? I said that um, one of the things about these uh, workshops is to see how different uh, disciplines approach a subject. Well, there's also a, a different approach here. We've got the philosopher who's not going to be using PowerPoint tonight. Quite <laughs> 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 a difficult philosopher. Um, okay, so now we're going to switch gears a little bit because we've had a bit of science. Um, and I think sometimes it's the philosophy that people are surprised by when they think, what, what philosophers have to say about this? So let's see if Richard can help us with that. Okay, thank you. So is the handout um, made its way roughly around? Good. You, does anyone know about a handout? Or access around? Okay, good. You don't really, you don't. Can someone? Okay. You don't really need it, but it does. Um, okay, so, so um, as Anisha said, I, I, I'm a philosopher. Um, disappointingly, perhaps, I have done quite a lot of work with some neuroscientists and psychologists in this area, so I'm not a utterly um, uncontaminated philosopher in this area. And I'm going to say a little bit about how I understand some of the neuroscience. This is somewhat contentious, and I think um, we probably don't see exactly eye to eye, but it, it's, it's close enough. And I'm going to back off as much as I can from the neuroscience, from the details of the neuroscience, in order to try and focus on the um, issues surrounding this for the notion of agency that we have. That is, the way we think of ourselves as people acting in certain sorts of ways, and the way that addiction impacts upon that, and also then the ways that we should think about responsibility in the light of that. So that's the kind of really philosophical stuff that I want to, I want to come to subsequently. So let me just start by glossing what I take to be a very common opposition in much of the both scientific and popular literature surrounding addiction. So you very often find that people talking on this topic either think of addictive behavior as not a compelled behavior, but as freely chosen like anything else. And therefore, once you think of it that way, it is something which, for which people should be held responsible in just the same way as they are for any other kind of behavior. So there's a, there's a powerful movement often supported by economists and some politicians um, Pushing for that kind of thought, you know, don't treat addiction as any different to anything else. On the other hand, you have a powerful movement um, supported, for instance, by NIDA in the US, by a lot of the medical establishment here, which goes to very much the other extreme and says, no, look, addiction is a disease. We should think of it like any other disease. And as in the same way that diseases are not to do with your agency, they just take away your agency. You're just under the control of the disease. So we should think of drugs like that, addictive drugs like that. So an addicted person is a compulsive person, they're out of control, they're not responsible for the things they're doing. There's that opposition, that's a binary opposition that you see in so much of the debate, and I think it's an extremely unhelpful one, because I think we need to acknowledge that addiction contains elements of both of those pictures. And the real job is thinking about the ways in which it combines something of each of those, and how we should think about agency in the light, in the light of that. Okay, so let me just very briefly say some of the um, sort of fine, some things which I think are reasonably solid findings, which um, some of them motivate one of those pictures and some motivate the other picture. So firstly, on the side of the sort of economist's way of thinking that this is just ordinary behavior like, like any other, there's lots of evidence which I think a lot of people find quite surprising when they first hear it to show just how sort of standardly voluntary a lot of addictive behavior is. So one finding became very clear after the First World War when a number of Scandinavian countries massively increased the price of alcohol was that the price elasticity of demand of alcohol, that is how much people stop taking it when the price goes up, 
resembles the price elasticity of perfectly ordinary non-addictive substances. Right, so as you put the price up, even addicts take less of it. And that's been a pretty strongly barren thing. To begin with, people just thought maybe it's the social drinkers who are drinking less, but then you started finding that liver diseases spell. Um, and then in a lot of other studies since, looking both at state-regulated things, but also just looking at the black market, it seems that addictive substances have this feature. Price goes up, people take less of them. And it's not just that they're priced out of the market. They could still afford to do it, but they just think it's not worth it at this point. You know, I know I'm going to do something else. I, uh, uh, it's not worth my while being an addict at this price. So that's an interesting thing. Another interesting thing, and this actually um, bears on um, something that, that was asked just before the break. A um, number of studies looking at the typical ages at which people are addicts. It, is, it does seem to be strongly a disease or a problem for people in their late 20s, sorry, late teens, early 20s, through to the late 20s, early 30s. It's a bit um, misleading if you look at the figures for people in treatment, because the people in treatment are often in a very bad way, and there's often very high comorbidity with other illnesses, especially with psychiatric illnesses. So if you look at that group, who are probably self-medicating with these um, things for those sorts of reasons, then you get a, a, a rather distorted view. If you look at um, addiction in people who, are, who do not have that comorbidity, who don't have those psychiatric diseases, it does look as though it's something which people get into in youth and kind of come out of in their 20s, late 20s, 30s. Not completely, but there's a lot of that. So that's interesting, because again, it looks as though it's something that people kind of give up. And moreover, a lot of those people are not giving it up as a result of treatment, but they're just deciding not to do it anymore, which is kind of interesting. We'll come to some of the reasons for that shortly. On the other hand, um, the rational choice models, which the economists push, typically have the feature that they think that people are addicted because they really don't like withdrawal. Right? So, and they know that if they don't keep, keep consuming, they'll go through withdrawal symptoms. And that's horrible. Right? So the economists think of these people as people with very steep discount curves. That is, they're really worried about tomorrow. And they're not so worried about two years hence. But because they're worried about tomorrow, and tomorrow, if they don't keep consuming, they're going to have awful withdrawal. They don't want to, they don't want to stop. Okay. Now, you could build a lovely model with that. A number of economists have done that. The problem is it really doesn't match the data at all well. So you put people into a clinic, you dry them out in some way or another. They go back home again. Now, these should be the people who have got the greatest immunity to consuming again, right? Because they know how horrible withdrawal was. They know how horrible it was when they were having to spend all this time and money on, on the drugs. So they should be perfectly protected from reconsuming. Of course they're not. That's the highest risk group. You drive people out, you put them back into the environment in which they were in. Those are the most likely people who are going to start reconsuming. And that points to another feature which is not well explained, I think, by the, um, by the standard choice models, which is that there is tons and tons of evidence that addiction is highly Q-sensitive. So if you go back into the places where you used to consume, you hang out with the people you used to consume with, that will cue you and will cue cravings in you which will set you off consuming again. A very good idea if you've been through one of these clinics is not to go back to the environment you were in before. And there's tons of evidence around that. I can talk about some of the findings. A lot of this, not just human findings, but also with, with rat models as well. In fact, actually taking an addictive drug in a place where you're not used to taking the addictive drug is much more likely to be fatal at the same dosage. So there's some very deep physiological um, phenomenon there of adaptation to the environment in which you're used to taking it. Okay, so I think what we've got here is, is this kind of interesting confluence of something where there's some rational control. People can give up without... Um, 
other interventions. They can stop for all kinds of different reasons. But on the other hand, there's something which is clearly not ordinary behavior going on here. There's a very strongly Q-driven behavior. Let me very briefly talk about some of the models for that, because I think these then become important when we start thinking about why those kinds of behaviors work as they do, and hence for the model of human action that we need behind that. Um, as we heard earlier, there's, there was a lot of findings, there were many findings which implicated the mesolimbic dopamine system in addiction. So pretty much all the addictive drugs seem to either trigger or um, otherwise um, increase the uptake or release of dopamine in the mesolimbic regions, especially around the nucleus accumbens, as, as, as we were hearing. Um, an early view of that was that that was to do with pleasure. Right. The thought was drugs are incredibly pleasurable. You get far more pleasure from drugs than you would get from you know, reading Tolstoy or something. So people take the drugs rather than Tolstoy, and Tolstoy gets crowded out. Right. That, was, that was roughly the view of it. The evidence, as I read it, and as certainly as Ken Berish, who I've done some of this work with, who, uh, who was mentioned earlier, um, argues, is that the dopamine system isn't really doing isn't really in the pleasure business at all. It's in the wanting business. So distinguish wanting and liking. We all do distinguish that. Um, that is, you can want something when you have it, you don't like it. But it also looks as though you could not even anticipate you were going to like it, and yet still want it. On this view, what happens in addiction, basically, is that the wanting system gets out of whack with everything else. So, an addictive substance, because of the way it stimulates the dopamine system, lays down, firstly, an immediate desire for the object, but secondly, and crucially, it lays down a long-term sensitization to the cues surrounding that, subject, that substance, which is such that when you encounter those cues, you develop a strong craving for the thing that was earlier associated with them. So you see the, 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 um, the cues for addiction, or maybe you just think about them, you just reflect on those features, and that gives rise to a very strong craving in the agent. And that's the thing which is kind of out of control in addiction. Think about roughly what's happening there. Again, this is controversial, and the, the evidence is better in rats than it is in human beings. Um, but at least let's just talk about rats to begin with. Right? Rats, like us, are highly opportunistic creatures. They're not like... Uh, my, my, the contrary to a rat, in my thinking, is a koala. Right? A koala eats four different kinds of eucalyptus leaf, and if it can't get them, it dies. It's, uh, it's, that's all it can eat. So there's no question for a koala to try and work out what it's going to eat. It just goes for those, koala, those, um, those eucalyptus leaves. Rats are the other extreme. Right? Rats will try anything. That's why they're such good models for us, because you know, by and large, we have succeeded as a species because of our ability to fit into new niches, to try anything, to be highly adaptive. So we need some system that enables us, once we've tried something, which in some way our body finds good, to work out that's the thing I'm going to get in the future. Okay, now you can imagine two different ways your body could do that. One way it could do it is that it could have an intrinsic desire for pleasure. Right? That's all it really wants. And many philosophers have thought we're like that. We just want pleasure. And everything we do, we do instrumentally in order to try and get that pleasure. Right? So it could be that when you sample a nice food, it gives you pleasure. You remember that. You learn it. And then next time you see the food, you think, oh, I'll eat that one because that's the one that's so pleasurable. Try chocolate, it was great, you tried again. Strawberries, well, sometimes they're great, sometimes they're not, you know. But by and large, strawberries are good enough when they're good to make you want to make you want to have, you know, highly concentrated saline solution, not nice. Don't try it again. That's that's the more. I think my reading of the evidence here, and certainly Berich's reading, is that this isn't actually how the body's working. At least it's not primarily working. It's not that we have only an intrinsic desire for pleasure. 
It's that we have intrinsic desires for these substances. Right? It's not that the body says, ah, this is going to be pleasurable, therefore I'm going to go for this. It's that the body just says, ah, that's the thing, go for that. That means that those desires are independent of any pleasure you might get, but also independent of your own views about what would be in your long-term interests. Right? They are insulated from the thought, that's not going to be good for me in the long run, therefore I don't want it. You want it even though you have the belief that this thing isn't going to be good for you in the long run. Right? Contrast this with something else. You know, a, a new phone comes out, and it's the you know, iPhone 16, and you're lusting after it because you're 15, you've had for only four months, and you think it's about time you had a new phone. And then the reviews come out, and everybody says, oh, the iPhone 16 is a complete piece of junk. Apple have finally lost the plot. Bring back Steve Jobs, etc., etc. You don't then keep the desire for the iPhone 16, but think, oh, gosh, I better not buy it, because actually it's no good. Right? As soon as you realize the thing's no good, your desire for it just dissolves. That desire is contingent. It's conditional on your belief about this being a good thing that will give you pleasure that will benefit your life. Whereas I think your desire for addictive drugs actually like your desire for other foodstuffs too. For sucrose, for you know, many other things, is something which is independent of those beliefs. Okay, now once you do it that way, we've got a really good account of why it is that there's this sort of out of control bit, right? But how do we get back the thought that there is some control? Well, I think that the, what the neuroscience and the social psychology have been converging on, although in, you know, no, we've got nothing like a perfect picture of how this works, but at the very least, you need to think of human motivation as partitioned into different parts, some of which is to do with the kind of primary drives or primary desires, and some of which is to do with the control of those. This comes back to these issues about inhibition and the like. So you could have a powerful desire for something, and you can inhibit it. Now that looks to be probably a prefrontally controlled thing. It's probably working in somewhat different ways to the ways that dopamine circuit's working. But again, all this, the details are controversial. But the overlying pattern, I think, is, is right. And this is one of the reasons why you've got to be a little bit cautious of the rat studies. Right? Because the rat studies are really focusing just on creating those desires. Whereas with human beings, we've got very developed cognitive systems which can be looking at long-term benefits and consequences for other people and things like that. You have a system which is doing its best to rein in those first-order desires that are driven just by the um, cues that are surrounding the addictive substances. So that's why I think we've got a, very, a much more complicated vision there of human agency than either of the two pictures that I started with. Right? You've got, firstly, the, the desires which are being just cued by the cues around you. And then you've got an attempt to try and inhibit those desires. Now, one of the things that I think is, is, um, is interesting here, and we'll, we'll, I, I could talk more about this, but let me just gloss it quickly, is that our effectiveness in using that, that self-control will itself be massively influenced by our beliefs about how effective the self-control is. And will also be massively influenced by a narrative we tell about what's happening with us, why it's happening, what's going to happen. So coming back to some of the things that Anita was talking about right at the beginning, it's true, there isn't a classical, a, a Greco-Roman conception of addiction. This is a very late thing, it's a 17th century invention, really, the idea that, at least as a, as a concept, the idea that addiction isn't just someone who likes their wine too much, right? The Greeks had that. It's the idea that it's someone who's out of control. And I think that, you know, as we see, the brain science shows that there's something right about that. There is something out of control. The, des the desires are well out of control of the addict. These just come up as a result of seeing the, seeing the substances. Um, but insofar as you have a story which tells you that you're an agent who is out of control, that affects the likelihood you have of regulating those desires. 
So just to think, you know, think about this. Suppose you're trying to give up smoking, and you're aware of the desire you have for a cigarette, and you think, wow, that desire is so strong that if I manage to control it today, I'm sure I'm not going to control it tomorrow. Well, what's the point of controlling it today? Then? You're just going to have a miserable day and then go back to smoking tomorrow. Right? You need to have the confidence that the regulation you're going to be doing is going to be sufficient to control that in the long run. Now, that, once you've got that kind of structure there, there are all kinds of interesting things that can happen. So, so one thing which is surprising in the States, there have been a number of experiments, keeping people clean by paying them small amounts of money. These have been much more effective than anybody expected them to be. Typically, they work with, a, with an escalating payment. So the first time you come in clean, you might get a dollar. Second time you come in clean, you get two dollars, and it goes up to you know, ten dollars, twelve dollars. Peanuts compared with spending money on putting someone in a treatment program. It's very, very cost effective. Um, if you if you come in and you're not clean, you go right back to the beginning. Right. So you lose twelve dollars or whatever each week. What happens with this? Well, it's quite effective. Why is it effective? I think it's effective because the person isn't then thinking, am I able to get myself off being an addict? Right? They're looking at a much more short-term goal. They're looking at the short-term goal of getting 12 bucks. Right? Well, they can handle that. This doesn't bring with it the weight that comes when you're thinking with every attempt to consume, wow, this is indicative of my ability to not be an addict. That's a huge weight to this manages to trivialize it. Well, that's an extreme version. I think we play with these ideas all the time. And I think one of the really fascinating things, I mean, fascinating is also tragic, with, with a lot of addiction, is that addicts tend to be very self-absorbed in their addiction. Of course they are. It's taking huge amounts of their time and whatever. And they are telling narratives all the time about what they can and can't do. And that's massively affecting their success in doing that or not doing it. So one thing I think we really need to do is to sort of empower the narratives that enable them to get clean, rather than empowering the narratives which don't. And there's an interesting question as to whether or not the truth is empowering or not in these cases. You know, rather politically sensitive question. Um, OK, I should be I'm pretty much out of time, aren't I? Um, what more can I say? Let me just wrap up just with a couple more um, general philosophical things you might like to think about. First thing, a lot of philosophers think that the job of a government or of a moral theory is to help you maximize the satisfaction of your desires. Right. That is the desire. That's, that's the good outcome. Right. So um, preference satisfaction utilitarians, for instance, are doing this. They think, what's a good life? A good life is one where your desires get satisfied. Once you understand the nature of these incentive salience desires, that is the desires that are there in addiction, that becomes a much less plausible approach, I think. I don't think we can just say, look, the person desires it, therefore we should fulfill the desire. You've got to look at something that's a lot more complex than that. You've got to start looking at whether that desire is worthwhile or not, including looking at how, whether the agent thinks it's worthwhile or not. So it's not a thing that you just go in and tell the agent what to do. But I think you've got to realize that you can discriminate between the agent's own desires, and you've got to start you know, thinking carefully about those. Second question, the second thing, which someone asked about behavioral addictions and how much you should think of behavioral addictions on the model of um, these chemical addictions. I think, basically, my reading of the evidence here is that the state you end up in with a behavioral addiction is actually very similar to the state you end up in with you know, taking amphetamines or whatever. That is, you get these desires which are Q-driven and which are largely unresponsive to the other beliefs you have about how good they are for you, for your family, for the community, whatever. What's rather different is the etiology, is the causal structure, how you get that. Because the addictive substances do it by going in and actually fiddling directly with the dopamine system and perhaps other systems. Whereas the behavioral ones don't do it so directly. They do it actually using the standard mechanisms you've got of getting pleasure from the activity. So I think when someone says, is this, is this an addiction or isn't it? I think it's just, that's a rather blunt question. And I want to answer it by saying, well, 
do you end up in a state which is like an addiction, like a chemical addictions? Absolutely. Do you get there by the same route? As far as we know so far, probably not. Last thing, and then this ties into this. Sucrose, a lot of discussion as to whether sucrose consumption should be thought of as an addiction. And so my answer here is, well, you know, actually it doesn't look as though sucrose manages to have an immediate effect on dopamine, has kind of disproportionate effect on dopamine in the way that um, nicotine, cannabis, alcohol, whatever does. On the other hand, you get into a thing which is very similar, right? It's Q-driven. You go past all those chocolates on the way past towards the till in the supermarket. You see them, you just respond to them, right? You see the, the scones with the jam and cream on the table out there. You might have decided you weren't going to eat anything before supper. You respond to them in a way which is very direct. It's an intrinsic desire which has been con conditioned by having tasted things like that in the past. You might even keep eating them when you've passed the point of enjoying them. Right? We've all done that, I think. With, you know, bad quality chocolates. You just keep eating. God, why the hell am I doing this? And you keep <laughs> doing it, right? This clearly isn't from anticipated pleasure. It's just that you're being stimulated by those cues and you're responding to them in those, in those sorts of ways. Um, so I think there's something very much like addiction happening there because it's basically using that same incentive salient system. Now one thing I've been thinking about recently, and again I'd be interested if people have views on this, how do you think about regulating that and the state's ability to regulate that? I think there's a parallel here which has not been thought about much but is potentially fruitful. In general we think that environments which are polluted are environments that the state ought to control. So if you've got asbestos in your building, it's the state's job to make sure that that asbestos, I'll right? take a you know, random example with an Oxford psychology, um, it's the state's job to regulate what goes on there. If the local factory is pumping out carcinogenic exhaust fumes, right, we regulate it. If you think that what's happening in addiction is that you are responding to cues in this way. You can think of those cues as themselves giving you, effectively, a polluted environment. So I think, insofar as we think that pollution should be regulated, we might well think that the pollution which the chocolate bars buy the checkout in the supermarket constitute should be a proper target of state regulation. But I leave that for discussion. that um, Richard is Richard Holton and he is a fellow of um, Peter House Cambridge, the South European Cambridge, like um, Professor Daly. Um, I also just wanted to say that we have um, another, uh, uh, somebody who can answer questions up here, in, and this is our psychologist here at St. Hilda's, um, Dr. Anne Dalker. Um, she's also part of the executive committee with myself and the two, uh, the people here holding the, the microphones. So um, that's why you see us around. Okay. So um, I'm sure these are the people you want to ask the questions to, but we might come in as well. So over to you. Thank you very much. It was an interesting talk, and I wanted to pick up on your notion about persons' beliefs, let's say, in conquering, you know, those urges or or things we say, and about labeling ourselves, basically. I mean, I know my, my knowledge is very limited from me, from, from movies like, you know, about anonymous alcoholic, you know, I'm John, I'm alcoholic. And it's kind of you put label on yourself that you are actually an addict trying to control these urges, whether it might be more effective if you don't label yourself as an addict, but tackle the problem. And I'm just, just, just a lot about labeling and effectiveness of treating the disorder. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a very interesting question, and as you say, it's a marked feature of Alcoholics Anonymous and of the other 12-step programs, that they very much go in for this idea that you say that's what you are and will always be. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, if you talk to people who are doing therapy for smoking, it's typically the other way around. Mm -hmm. So smokers are typically told, you know, deep down you're not really a smoker, are you? You're just doing this thing. My suspicion is actually we're pretty good at telling stories 
And we can tell a story with either of those premises that results in a reasonable path for getting clear. Because at least as I read the evidence, the distinction between the smoking therapies and Alcoholics Anonymous, they're fairly similar in their efficacy. But of course it does mean that if you're doing the AA approach, you better not just say, well, you're an alcoholic, end of story. Right? You better say, you're an alcoholic, that means you need to do these kinds of things. Whether there could be any benefit in taking a path slightly different from that, at the moment I don't think there's evidence there is, but it seems something which certainly is worth doing more studies on and seeing what there's a path. Yeah, I was interested in this uh, idea of hitting rock bottom. You hear these stories of people who've been addicted to heroin and all yeah. kinds of drugs for years, ruined their lives, and, but suddenly they hit this rock bottom and they just stop from one day to the other. Yeah. Um, and especially seen from this uh, disease model of addiction, how your thoughts on, on how, how, how do you explain that? Uh, if, it's, if it is a disease, indeed. Yeah, I mean, my thought here is two things happen. Yeah. One is typically such people um, make a decision not to respond to the cravings they've got. And secondly, they typically do something which, which is effective at removing them from some of the system, situations in which those were affecting them. So very often the rock bottom stories involve moving away, right? Splitting up with someone, taking another job, going overseas, joining the church, you know, any number of different things, but they're things which give a very different narrative structure to the person afterwards. I don't know what. Actually, Rich, I, I agree on a very important point of context. How important, I think we underestimate the importance of environment. And if you can move people to a different environment, give structure to their lives in terms of employment, finding greater control, religious experience or whatever, those can help. And I, but that rock bottom point, uh, it's very interesting, and, and the realisation, probably at that point, and maybe interacting with lots of variables that we don't fully understand about how they can then turn their lives around. It's, it's uh, a fascinating question. But can I just yeah. press it a little bit? Because I was interested in the, the, the brain model, and because you said if you think of it as a disease, how do you explain it? And you're answering it, well, here are some yeah. sociological phenomena, environmental phenomena that explain it. But the question if was about the, how the disease model would explain it. If you're being exposed, and for example, heroin for an extended period of time, we know there are associated brain changes. There are compensations, um, often which are long-lasting, possibly permanent. Um, you answer yourself in saying how you then resist the temptation to continue. And so what is that control mechanism? There's a top-down cognitive control mechanism which is eroded by drugs. So our ability to take decisions become myopic. We've talked about delay discounting that addicts don't care about tomorrow, what matters is now. So I think there is something to be said about this outlook. But rock bottom, the brain change you see it, uh, can be devastating. So, you know, in that sense, it's, it's hard, and, and sometimes these are very idiosyncratic cases of how you would then study that experimentally. What, what you'd have to do in order to, to mimic something like that experimentally actually would be extremely challenging. Um, yeah, I mean, it would be an opportunistic experiment. <laughs> Uh, and as far as I know, you, you don't get this with rodent populations, right? Yeah. You don't get rats that think, oh, you know, I've had enough of this, you know, <laughs> look at my life. Um, that's a very human. Can I just add, because, you know, um, Jeff, you gave us a, a, a pyramid, yeah. a triangle, and you had drug, host, environment. And I was very struck by the word host. And I, I would have thought, in the light of what Richard was saying, that maybe the word host might be modified a little. I don't know. I think it's helpful to have the analogy of any infected 
disease, or if we think of that as a helpful analogy, that a host, um, in order to be infected by some pathogen, oh. would have some underlying predisposition which would make them vulnerable okay. and not someone else. So I think the, the word host actually in this context is important. Yeah. I mean, my so thought predisposition. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, my, my thought is that if you do that, though, and this does come back to this point, you shouldn't identify the host with the person. Right. Mm. Exactly. So, so you might think the host is to do with, you know, the craving system in the person, something like that. But so the question here is the interaction between those cravings, which I think would still go on, and the behaviour of the of the person which is regulated not just by those, but also by the resolutions they've taken to stop, the narrative they tell about the life that they will lead hereafter, and those, those kind of other features. I think my, my question is kind of similar to, to what he's just asked. Um, I know earlier on um, the first speaker, and I think um, um, the, the last speaker did say um, that young people between the ages of around 20 and 30, um, they, they tend to kind of grow out of addiction. And along the line, you also, also didn't mention that addiction takes over your behavior, it takes over the whole of you, you cannot control yourself. So my question is, how can you come out of something like that just on its own? Uh, is it not just that people experiment at that age, and some of the things that they're not addicted to, they just drop off? And then what remains are the addictive behavior which they struggle with later in life? Uh, and just attached to that place, what if it's a genetic issue, if, if, you, if you inherited it, like you said, about 50% possibility that you could have that, is that something you can just grow out of as well when you're over 30? I think that the, the biological markers, I'm afraid you inherit, they're there. Um, there are many we don't understand, there are many mechanisms we don't understand. What we're sure about is that addiction is much more than dopamine and this mesolimbic dopamine system innovating new succumbents. Undoubtedly, that's important. I think your first part of your question was about these critical windows and, you know, 20-year-olds, 25-year-olds. That's a point where your cognitive control systems, these top-down mechanisms that we have, are able to regulate and control behavior. They're not fully mature leading up to those ages. Risk-taking behavior and all that corresponds to that period of life. After that, many individuals that... that rates of, of problematic drug use drop off, but there are some individuals for which it continues and, and exacerbates. Those are the people that we need to know more about some of the predictive markers, and what we're trying to do now in, in the research we do in Cambridge is to look at markers which you can simply look at, for example, a blood sample, and looking at the expression of genes from white blood cells which are very, turns out to be a good proxy for many of the receptors in the brain, and so that we can build a profile of markers, together perhaps with brain scan at a very early age, that might inform us about the likelihood, and there's no guarantee, the likelihood of future drug use. But, but there are also some uh, cultural uh, contexts that you need to take into consideration, for instance, they, there were some data released yesterday on alcohol consumption in the UK showing that the young generation nowadays drinks much less than the previous one. So we now have a situation where the older generation are drinking even more than the, than the young ones, which is, uh, is, is new. Usually you have the 16 to 24 drinking in excess of, of everybody else, but now we have a, a change in drinking behavior, which is, you know, is it's not just genetics, it's also what people are expecting of their life, so they don't find alcohol as attractive as other people or other generations have found before them. So you have this kind of shift in, in drinking. Can I, can I just add a little bit? So I, I, I had these three possibilities that I put on the hand up and I didn't get to talk about. Um, so, you know, when you're wondering why does it change as people get older, it could be that you think that the desire gets less. So Ken Berich, who, as I said, I've done a lot of this work with, he thinks we're all on our way to Parkinson's. Right? Parkinson's involves dopamine loss. He thinks by your late 20s, you know, you're not feeling those desires as you did. That, that's one explanation, right? I don't know. Second explanation, your self-control itself might get stronger. That, that's basically this sort, right? I mean, 
It's maturing. It takes time. There does seem to be a gender distinction here. It looks like mid-twenties for, for men. It looks like early twenties for women. But maybe so you're getting a more effective self-control thing. The third possibility could be that your motivation to deploy that self-control goes up. And that comes back to these issues about rock bottom and the like. But think about what's happening in people's lives. So, you know, by their early 30s, a lot of people, they've got a career they're worried about. They might have a partner they're serious about. They might have kids. They might have a house. You know, there might be many different things that they've got into that now suddenly, well, not suddenly, but at this point are looming larger in their importance than their habit is. So, you know, it could just be that there's more at stake for them now than there was earlier on. And we don't need any more dramatic explanation for it than that. Um, I've noticed that addiction can escalate due to stress in one's life. For example, my friend um, uh, got addicted to video game when there, uh, there was a connection coming. So um, I'm thinking about uh, what's the relationship between addiction and the uh, cognitive resource that's available to the agent. I mean, my thought on this is to do with self-regulation. So there's lots of evidence that self-regulation goes down when you increase cognitive load. So, for instance, if you ask someone to do one task and you give them another task to do at the same time, they're not so good at doing the first task because the cognitive load has gone up with the second task. You ask people to try and control their emotions while they are, you know, reading something backwards off the bottom of the screen or reciting down from 300 in threes or something like that. They're much worse at controlling their emotions. So one general possibility here is not that the desires are increased, but that the capacity to resist those desires go down as a result of stress increasing the cognitive load. That would be my guess, but I don't know conclusive evidence for this. I mean, st stress can work in, in a variety of ways. And we know that stress can be beneficial. Stress can be, you know, when you're highly aroused, performance can decline. And I think it matters where you are on that continuum, this inverted U, how stress interacts with, with performance like this. Okay. I'm going to just ask if there's one more question. <coughs> oh, actually, we have three now. <laughs> um, I'm interested in this sort of monetary reward and it being immediate. Um, because this, again, sort of relating to lots of things that you said, really, because of the stress as well and cognitive element, you don't have a problem there, do you? You get that immediately, you don't have the emotions, don't get crowded in. Um, and, and also, you know, if people, people in London maybe tend to be more impulsive, but if you give them that immediate reward, then, you know, they're satisfied very quickly, but you're controlling it. So um, it seems to be longer term, quite an effective way of doing something. Um, but it, does it really, um, in that point, does it really last long term? You know, what are their lapse rates with um, the people who did well in terms of controlling, you know, their, their drug misuse after that sort of program? So I don't think the evidence is overwhelming, but I think it, it lasts much better than you might think. So, you know, I think we have this view that there's sort of, it's almost a cathartic theory of addiction, right? There's this deep thing underneath which is going to come out somewhere, and if we manage to control it at this point, it's just going to bubble out somewhere else. And I think that's probably a misleading thing. I think what a lot of these short-term things do is give people the confidence that they can be effective in what they're controlling. Okay. I think we're going to have to just a quick question, okay? If you, if you can make um, there was one, uh, one of the big issues seems to be whether the person is responsible for their addiction or not. And you mentioned that um, two different approaches of the alcohol and smoking one treat responsibility is different, but uh, quite similar in their efficacy. So um, does it really matter if the person is responsible or not? Should it matter? I mean, I think it does matter. It matters for how we treat them. Um, and it matters for how they think about themselves. But I think we've got to, you know, Christianity has developed over many centuries 
an ability to distinguish between the things you're responsible for and the things you're not responsible for in a way that made meditation and the like work. Right? So the thought was, you're not responsible for letting a bad thought into your mind. That happens. You are responsible for dwelling on it. Right? Look at spiritual meditation. Exactly. You get lots of that kind of thinking. So you're making a distinction between one thing which is going to happen anyway and another which you've got more control over. I think with addiction we need to think, we need to accept that you're not responsible for these cravings keep coming in. You do have some responsibility for how you respond to those though. But even that we should realise that responsibility is not an on-off issue. Philosophers have a real tendency to say either you're responsible or you're not. I think we should think responsibility comes in degrees. And the person who's under the grip of a powerful addiction has less responsibility than someone else. And also, as I said at the beginning with this work by Hannah Pickard, it's this responsibility without demonization yes. and blame. And I yes. think that that's an important component in thinking about responsibility. We tend to think responsibility and you're bad if you don't take responsibility. And yes. I think that's what we also need to... Yeah. Okay, because I kept you a little late. Thank you very much. I just want to, I hope that I'll see many of you next year again. And I should say that this and all the other um, uh, workshops we've had this year are now on video and they're on our website. So um, if you want to catch up on the ones you missed, you can find them there. Thank you very much and thank you to the speakers.